Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Christopher DeSimone. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. I'm also director of communications and marketing here at Mayo Clinic. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar, State of the Art, Sleep Apnea and Cardiovascular Diseases. We're in for a real treat today as we have an expert in the field, Dr. Vren Summers, who is the Alice Sheets Marriott Professor of Medicine here in Cardiovascular Disease at Mayo Clinic. A few ground rules. We're gonna try to keep this as informal as possible. Please feel free to send in any questions you have and we'll do our best to answer these live. If we don't get to all of them, we surely will afterwards. In addition, this video will be up within the next one to two weeks on our Mayo Clinic CV education webinar website. Dr. Varen Summers is a true leader in this field. He's been on guideline documents. He's a pioneer in the research in this area. And I all think we're going to have a very nice time enjoying what's new in the field and what's new to come and also clarify any expectations of this not being the greatest webinar you've seen this year. So I'll turn it over, Varen. Yeah, Chris, it's going to be tough to, to beat that introduction, but thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. And uh, welcome to everybody. And uh, I'll be talking about sleep apnea and cardiovascular diseases and really give you, give you some very brief background as to what's, you know, what sleep apnea is about and why we care about it as cardiologists. And then try to focus more on, on more recent developments in terms of how we understand uh, the link between sleep apnea and things like hypertension, atrial fibrillation, sudden death. So uh, these are my disclosures, and, and they're important to keep in, uh, keep in mind, given the context of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and, and so, so about in, in 2008, uh, we had published a, a, a scientific statement, a consensus document on sleep apnea and heart disease, and, and we really you know, we knew a lot, but, but the big deficit at that point was the, ra the presence of randomized controlled trials. And uh, more recently, just uh, maybe a couple of months ago, uh, published in circulation is a follow-up document led by uh, Yerem Yegezerians, uh, who is chief of uh, cardiology at the uh, University of San Francisco. And, and I recommend everybody look at this document because it gives you a more updated vision of, of what sleep apnea is about, how we diagnose it, how we treat it, and, and why cardiologists should care about it. Um, the things that are new, the things that are new in the, in, the, in the most recent scientific statement are the following. The fact that home sleep testing is now widely accepted as part of standard of care, and I'll talk more about that shortly. Also that, you know, for many years, we, we thought the AHI, the apnea hypopnea index was the key metric to think about sleep apnea. But now we're beginning to learn, actually, maybe not. Maybe there are other components. Maybe there are other stresses, other, other signatures of sleep apnea that are more predictive of heart disease. And things that, you know, we can think about be hypoxemia, how low the oxygen falls during the night, how sleepy you are really important measure, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. Sleep fragmentation, how disrupted your sleep is, and, and the duration and distribution of apneic events. It's not just having an apneic event. You could have one that, that's very brief and very mild, or you could have one that, that's really long and profound, and both of them would count as one on the AHI, but they're completely different things. So, so this is why we have to start thinking about sleep apnea differently. Also important are uh, disparities, disparities, racial, ethnic, sex disparities between men and women, disparities in diagnosis, in treatment, and in outcomes. It turns out that probably people are very different uh, in, in how they respond to apnea treatment and, and what benefits they may get out of it. Uh, also, we, we focus on a number of the new newly completed randomized controlled trials of treatment with CPAP. The other thing that you'll hear more about from me over the next 40 minutes or so is that, that comorbidity does not imply causality. So let's say you have somebody who's got high blood pressure. High blood pressure is really common. And then you've got someone with sleep apnea, and that's very common. 
you could get high blood pressure from a totally different cause, and you could also have sleep apnea. And it doesn't mean because Mr. Jones has hypertension and sleep apnea, that the sleep apnea is causing the high blood pressure. So ergo, it doesn't mean that treating the apnea is going to fix the blood pressure because the apnea is not causing the hypertension. So keep that in mind in terms of our, our previous expectation that just because you got sleep apnea and disease X, if we treat sleep apnea, disease X is going to get better. Not really, not unless disease X is, is primarily secondary to the apnea. And the last is using some of what I told you, find those high risk subgroups who are most responsive to treatment. Those who are sleepy, those who are more severely hypoxemic. And, and something that's really uh, attracting a lot of interest, the microRNA signature in the bloodstream. That seems to be based on work from Spain. There's a microRNA profile that'll actually tell you which patients will respond to CPAP by lowering their blood pressure and which patients won't. And again, Chris, please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions or, or something comes up at the time I'm talking about it. So very quickly, diagnostic evaluation for sleep apnea. This is what we all loved for many years, polysomnography, overnight study, very expensive, very demanding on personnel and time. And now because of the demand for treatment, we've got approval of home sleep apnea testing using different devices. And I won't go into those, but this is the table from the recent scientific statement. So you'll be able to get that. In fact, a lot of slides I'm showing you are gonna be from there. So you'll be able to get, get hold of them. Uh, but the point here is that you can now study somebody at home. You can do multiple studies at home. So in the old days, we do polysomnography, which is like a photograph of a movie. But now you can do home sleep testing. You do it on multiple nights. So you can actually get a more fuller picture of, of what the movie is about. And Varen, that's important. Um, I think one thing, does that supplant or may supplant the overnight oximetry screening test? Or would you still recommend to our listeners, that's our first point? I of. like the overnight oximetry. I like it a lot. So I tend to go with that. Unless Fair. the clinical picture is so compelling that I'm pretty sure yeah. the patient has sleep apnea. But that's a great question. Excellent. So it doesn't hurt to look at, remind you how we diagnose sleep apnea, signs and symptoms, daytime sleepiness, morning headaches, memory difficulties, irritability, uh, affect changes, difficulty concentrating, nocturia, very important nocturia, decreased libido and erectile dysfunction, because remember, you produce testosterone at night. And so if you disrupt your nighttime sleep, you're going to impair your testosterone production. And that's a great incentive to get many male patients to, to, um, uh, to actually uh, come along to see, to see a sleep specialist and maybe use their treatment. Patients tend to be, but not always, obese, increased neck circumference, Mullen party score more than or equal to three. And this is the Mullen party score at the bottom. Think about it as you can see the, the uvula, and there's a big gap between it, or you can't see it at all. And that's four, and this is one, and in between is two and three. Uh, and then craniofacial abnormalities, people who have small jaws are often uh, have an increased likelihood of, of obstructive apnea. So cardiovascular implications, pathophysiology, uh, we get hypoxemia, autonomic uh, activation, arousals, intrathoracic pressure changes because you're creating this negative pressure. You're struggling to breathe in against a closed upper airway and you, you increase the volume of the chest and the negative pressure is in the chest and that messes with the cardiac structure and cardiac function. Also hypercapnia, which is generally underestimated. All of these give you an epithelial dysfunction, give you systemic inflammation, metabolic issues, uh, left atrial enlargement, high level of synthetic drive. And then they cause a range of cardiovascular diseases. The ones I'll touch on today, high blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, uh, briefly on coronary artery disease and myocardial infarction, and sudden cardiac death. I think one part, uh, Varen, if, if you yeah. could comment on, I've noticed a lot of patients, especially when they're referred, I usually see them for atrial fibrillation, Right. And they can have a very low BMI, very healthy exerciser. And one of the questions I first ask is, do you have sleep apnea or have you ever been screened? 
and people with BMI of 19, 20, 20, no, no, I don't have it. You know, my doctor told me I wouldn't have it. Obviously there's that phenotype where you say, mm, this patient probably has it, but I've picked up a lot of patients with atrial fibrillation that had sleep apnea who don't fit that board exam classic type. Are we screening more and more patients and seeing that? Or is that just part and parcel, a different phenotype of this sleep apnea, the not one size fits all? Great question, and I don't know the answer to that. Clearly, one size does not fit all, but usually if I find a patient who's lean with obstructive sleep apnea, especially if it's a woman, I often will check if there's sleep apnea in the family. Mm. Because then there usually is, 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 a, is a small jaw micrognathia, maybe structural airway problems that, are, that may be, may be in, uh, genetic or familial. And so that's something to bear in mind. Uh, Excellent. So people, it's not for our for our listeners. It's not just neck circumference weight, correct. although that's a big part. But there's correct. other factors. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's the overall clinical gestalt you get. Yeah, fantastic. Absolutely. So let's talk about high blood pressure. And uh, you know, when you think of high blood pressure, I'll show you the slide to give you a better understanding of what apnea does to blood pressure and sympathetic activity acutely. So this is an apneic. Newly diagnosed, never treated. He's wide awake. This is a sympathetic activity. We record it from a peripheral nerve. This is breathing, and this is the intraarterial blood pressure, 130 over 60. Now, he goes to sleep. He's in REM. Now, REM is a time that obstructive apneas are worse because in REM, you have loss of muscle tone, and that loss of muscle tone affects the upper airway, and so the upper airway becomes kind of flaccid and much more easily collapsible on inspiration, which is why. You often get apnea. If you look at oximetry, you get clusters of desaturations. And that's because you're having clusters of REM, and that brings on the obstructive apneas. And so, so what you see here is obstructive sleep apnea with increases of sympathetic drive because of hypoxemia and hypercapnia. This causes vasoconstriction. So when you release the apnea and you start breathing again, you get a return of, of, of venous blood to the heart and cardiac output goes up and gets slammed into this vasoconstricted periphery. So your intraarterial blood pressure becomes 240 over 130. And that goes on repetitively through the night throughout REM. You treat them with CPAP and blood pressure is better, sympathetic activity is better. But the point I wanna make here is this high sympathetic activity and the higher blood pressure actually carries over into daytime wakefulness. So people with sleep apnea have an independently increased risk of hypertension. But what happens when we treat the hypertension or, or treat the sleep apnea? This is a series of different meta-analyses, 16 studies, 10, seven studies, 12. These meta-analyses of, of randomized controlled trials of treating hypertensive apneic patients show the decreases in systolic in blue and diastolic in red blood pressure. So here you got a decrease of 2.5 in systolic and 1.8 in diastolic. And so you see that you overall, you get something between, I'd say, 2 and 3.5 in systolic and between 1 and, and 2 point something in diastolic. These, this, this, this uh, meta-analysis looked at people who are not sleeping. And you can see that there's, there's much less of a change in blood pressure if you're not sleeping. So remember those numbers, three-ish, two-ish in systolic and diastolic blood pressure, not very impressive. Here's your resistant hypertension meta studies. Studies in resistant hypertension randomized, randomized controlled trials shown on the left. And these are two meta-analyses on the right. And essentially, overall, you get a fall in blood pressure of between five and six millimeters of mercury or so. Now, you may think, okay, is that really worth all that effort? Well, it's important to see this in perspective because just a, a couple of, maybe a week or so ago, we had this paper in Jack Interventional doing a meta-analysis of ambulatory, by the way, all those were all ambulatory blood pressures I showed you. These are ambulatory blood pressures in people who underwent renal denervation, showing you the change in blood pressure. Um, and this is systolic on the top and diastolic on the bottom. And you look at the fall in systolic, about 3.6, and the fall in diastolics is less than two on average. So, you know, it's just, it's just to give you some perspective on, on, on how these things, how these changes would fit in to some of the interventions that we are, we are 
we are increasingly interested in. So hypertension, both obstructive apnea and hypertension are common and therefore can often be called morbid. The hypertension may not necessarily be secondary to the OSA. So treating the OSA may not necessarily lower blood pressure. The effects of CPAP therapy are inconsistent, perhaps because of this consideration. And the blood pressure fall is between two to three millimeters of mercury. And two things I hadn't shown you, but I'm telling you about is that oral appliances, not CPAP, but little things that fit on your jaw that hold your jaw forward when you sleep and stop the jaw falling backwards into the upper airway when you're in REM and you've got low muscle tone and everything's flaxed up here and that the jaw falls backwards, this will hold your jaw forward, stopping you from having apnea. And that can cause your blood pressure to fall by two to three millimeters of mercury. Often it's a great approach in people with mild apnea. UP3 is where they go in and they cut out, they, they, they do this, this surgery and cut out your soft palate and all that stuff. Did lower blood pressure, but it's really not a long standing option for treating sleep apnea, at least as, as much as we know at this point. So how about resistant hypertension? Sleep apnea is very common in resistant hypertension. Three months of CPAP versus no CPAP, reduced 24-hour blood pressure, about three millimeters of mercury. This I didn't show you, but I'm telling you spironolactone. Why spironolactone? Because in people with resistant hypertension, aldosterone seems to be really important. In people with resistant hypertension and obstructive apnea, aldosterone is hugely important. And so treating with spironolactone seems to be fairly effective, not just in lowering the blood pressure, but in this small trial, it actually decreased OSA severity. Very interesting that renal denervation, we did a couple of, so we did a pilot study and a randomized controlled study, both were published in hypertension, showing first that renal denervation was actually much more effective at lowering blood pressure if you're a resistant hypertensive person also had obstructive sleep apnea. And not only, and second, not only did it lower the blood pressure, but it also reduced the severity of sleep apnea. We don't know why that is. Why would renal denervation fix sleep apnea? Is it fluid retention? Is it decreasing edema of the upper airway? I'm not sure, but, but it was an interesting finding in, in two studies. It's really interesting. So do you think it's just another attack mode on reducing that sympathetic surge? Yeah, I, th I think I think you're right. I think I think the sympathetic reduction with renal denervation has effects beyond just the the vascular, the, the blood pressure changes. It's also affecting sodium retention. It's affecting uh, uh, water retention, and so you may have an increased intravascular volume, and that volume, when you lie supine, is more likely to cause congestion in the upper airway, uh, narrowing an already troubled airway. If yeah. Very nice, thank so, you. So, so this is a meta-analysis. Actually, one of my, a, a colleague I gave a talk with showed the slide, Sunita Kumar from Loyola. And she, uh, she, she let me be a few slides, one of them being this. And it was a, 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 an attempt to find out which phenotypes best predict um, uh, that, that sleep apnea will, 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 will accompany by hypertension will result in a fall in blood pressure if you treat the apnea. And the predictors of blood pressure response from this paper were uncontrolled blood pressure or resistant hypertension. People younger than 60, this is important. So it turns out from the literature that, that, that if you make it past 65, if you make it past 70 and you've got horribly bad apnea, but there's nothing wrong with you. You've got no hypertension, you've got no AFib, you've got no coronary artery disease. You know, you're gonna be okay. It just, there's something about being old and having apnea, but not having apnea related disease has, it's, you've been selected to be one of these resistant people who's also be, got hypoxemic preconditioning. And so you're less likely to get damage from the apnea. At least that's what we, we seem to be seeing from our data, from really good work by Peretz Levy and, 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 and several other people. So predict you get a better blood pressure response if you're less than 60 years old. If your O2 falls below 77%, the lower your oxygen falls, the better your blood pressure will respond to CPAP. If your AHI, you have lots of apneas, more than 30 per hour, and very importantly that you're sleepy. You have excessive daytime sleepiness with an upward sleepiness score of more than or equal to 10. 
then if you adhere into CPAP, you do better, just like tablets. You take the tablet, it lowers your blood pressure. You don't take the tablet, it doesn't lower your blood pressure. Then this other thing, microRNA profile, which is really an emerging area. You know, what is it? These are, again, data from Spain, where they found that, um, you know, a certain uh, tri triad of microRNAs were reflective of an increased likelihood of your patient benefiting from CPAP therapy. And Viren, if I can yeah. ask one thing sure. before we pivot to atrial fibrillation, the CPAP adherence, I think, is tremendously important. Now, I have some patients that once they get over that initial hump of hating their CPAP machine, absolutely love their CPAP machine. But another thing I've been trying to find what sweet spot is when to reassess with a, I just use an overnight oximetry. Hopefully I'm doing this right. To recalibrate, to make sure that I'm adequately treating their CPAP. Uh, sorry, adequately treating their obstructive sleep apnea. So meaning just because they have a CPAP and they're adherent, is it effective? Is there any guidelines or anything that you use, rule of thumb? Do you check once a year, once every two years? Do you not check at all? So that's great. I'm so glad you do that because a lot of people don't do that. They just give the CPAP and they say, okay, I'm done. You know, yeah. you really, that, that, that's really very responsible. Bring these people back to say, you know, are you using your CPAP? Is it effective? Because the CPAP, you know, the patient loses weight, they need less pressure. They gain weight, they need more pressure. You know, they drink alcohol, they probably need more pressure than they did when they didn't drink alcohol. And so, so yeah, I think what you, we have no specific recommendations to my knowledge. Maybe some of the sleep people in the audience can, can send it through the chat. But, but uh, to my knowledge, you know, it's, it's very much an operator dependent phenomenon. You bring them back depending on, 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 on what, how, how intensely you want to follow them. And that is You're a, leading right into it. If, if, yeah. What I do is if my patients have a recurrence of atrial fibrillation, sort of after they've been doing well for a year or two, I recheck. Right. So it's more of a, they'll tell me. Right. And then now the newer machines also have this, this algorithm where they actually give you a, a feedback on how much mass leak there was, how, how many apneas are there based on the machine's algorithm for computing apneas. But I like the overnight asymmetry. Simple way of saying, have I fixed the apnea? Because you got that baseline pre-apnea treatment as your oximetry, and you got a new oximetry and say, okay, am I doing you any good? So great, great move. Okay. Thank you. So atrial fibrillation. Uh, it's, it's lots of reasons to think that people with sleep apnea are going to have AFib because apnea is going to hypoxemic. They get simultaneous sympathetic and vagal activation. They get the blood pressure surges I showed you. They have these transmural pressure gradients that primarily stretch the atrium because it's the thinnest wall cardiac chamber. And they also stretch the great veins. And you know, as Chris will tell you better than most people, because uh, he's a cardiac electrophysiologist, uh, you know, the, 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 the pulmonary veins are, are very important as, as generators of atrial fibrillation. And then of course, systemic inflammation. So all of these, uh, give you atrial fibrillation. All of these are present in sleep apnea. And so, you know, it makes sense that, okay, apnea is going to get a fib. And when you look at the, 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 the longitudinal data and you start with people, none of whom had a fib at the outset, and you follow them for 15 years and you divide them. These people had no sleep apnea in yellow, mild OSA in red, moderate in green, and severe in orange. You find that if you had no sleep apnea, risk of getting new onset AFib, if you never had AFib before, is like two or three percent. If you have severe sleep apnea, it's tenfold greater. It's twenty percent. So, so clearly, there's this there's this dose response between having apnea and getting atrial fibrillation. And then more. That was observational. Now we've got more observational data. If you have an electrical cardioversion. You come in with AFib, we shock the heart into sinus rhythm, we send you home. What happens if we treat you with CPAP versus those people who didn't get CPAP? Not a randomized controlled trial, observational data. You have a lesser likelihood of recurrence of sleep apnea, uh, of AFib, recurrence of AFib. But nowadays, you know, most a lot of patients get uh, pulmonary vein isolation, which is, which is uh, essentially an ablation and works well. Um, and if you have apnea, 
and you get a PVI, treating the apnea actually favors CPAP use in terms of preventing a recurrence of atrial fibrillation. So it's amazing how consistent the data are, and but these are observational data. So the question is, what happens if you do a random control trial? So the first trial that I'm aware of is one that, that we did here, led by, by my colleague, Sean Caples. And what, what, what we did, or what he did, was he, he screened about 1,800 people, okay? Now, because of the diligent work of people like Chris and, and other cardiologists at Mayo, it's hard to find people with apnea in Rochester and Olmsted who are not being treated. And so we had a heck of a time finding untreated AFib people that we could randomize. At the end, if, end eventually we settled, we got say 25 people, randomized 12 to one group, 13 to the other group, either to PAP therapy or to usual care. And uh, we looked at time to AF recurrence. We followed them up for a year. And these people actually use their CPAP for about six hours per night. And we found no difference in the time to recurrent atrial fibrillation. So. We couldn't, or despite all the work we did, showing this amazing link between sleep apnea and new AFib and the fact that if you treat the sleep apnea, AFib is less likely to recur. We tried doing randomized control trial. We couldn't show it, in part because AFib is a hard thing. Like you never know if somebody got it or not. But, but there's a better study that came out earlier this year from Trine and colleagues. And what they did, they took people with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Oh, by the way, our study, the Cable study, they were not sleeping. And that was a big problem. This study also, they ended up not being sleepy, also a big problem. And for those people who don't know much about apnea, the reasons why sleepy people are not included in these randomized controlled trials is because we're all afraid to not treat a sleepy apnea because if they have a motor vehicle accident or do something bad at work or crash a tanker into a thing and release tons of oil into the ocean, then it becomes our fault in a way, kind of. So, so this is why nobody wants to randomize sleepy people. They're hesitant to. Now, in this study, they took people with paroxysmal AFib. They put implanted loop records. in. What those are, are little tiny devices that you kind of inject under the skin that actually can pick up every cardiac impulse, cardiac electrical impulse. And so you can see when people get AFib and when they don't. And uh, they randomized 109 people, four times as many people as we had. And they also didn't find a difference in atrial fibrillation burden, but I'll show you the data, but, but look at this. This is another problem. Not only were they not sleepy, these people had AF for five years plus. Now, so you gotta think, okay, if your atrium has been bouncing in and out of AFib and is all big and dilated and, and you know, is, is just so, so used to going to AFib at the drop of a hat or two hats or whatever, then how much are you going to be able to prevent this, this habituation of the atrium towards paroxysmal atrium? I don't know. And I'm happy for you to comment on this, Chris, when you feel, 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 feel you want to. It's a it's really interesting point yeah. because when you do the pulmonary vein isolation, which is basically ablating outside of the pulmonary veins and in the antrum, what we think we're also doing is denervating that part of the heart. And the denervation is what gets angry when we have these fluctuations in the sympathetic surge. So it kind of fits all together. Post PVI, you've denervated a lot of the ganglia that are around the heart, which were active and probably inciting or perpetuating triggers for atrial fibrillation. So the data make complete sense to me. Okay, great. I, I, I totally agree with you. In any event, in this study, they also found no difference, but in AF burden. So they looked at the total burden, you know, how much AF people had, the CPAP group in blue, the, the usual care group in orange, and you can see here, no real change and no real change from baseline to the last three months of monitoring. So takeaways from this, there was reasonably good PAP adherence. Are we looking at the right AF outcome? Is AF burden the key? These are again, non-sleepy, low-risk people. Duration of AF was long. What does that mean? AF and OSA, just like hypertension, common. They're hence commonly comorbid. So not every AF is due to the OSA. So treating the OSA may have nothing to do with the AF. And the last thing to keep in mind with sleep apnea, 
is we just need to think that maybe CPAP doesn't alter AF recurrence in OSA. We just have to, that may be the reality. Maybe we, we need other treatments. And here, I'm just gonna say something that, that I heard Susan Redline say once, I think. Uh, that's a colleague who works in sleep. And she said, well, just because a drug, a specific drug doesn't cure cancer, doesn't mean we shouldn't treat the cancer. So, so just because your treatment modality, that particular hammer doesn't work on that nail, you know, doesn't necessarily mean nothing's gonna work. So, but we don't know yet. I also think one thing that's very important, which you just told me, I just didn't realize or think through, if we're not including sleepier patients in the randomized trials, in those patients, you know, anecdotally, you would think they have the most to gain. So they would have the most treatment effect. So if we're eliminating those folks, even though the we have a null outcome or, or no difference, if we included those patients, again, we're only, this is conjecture, you would assume that you'd even have a better treatment effect. That, that's an absolutely important point. Now, I've got a slide that will speak to that just a little bit. Also bear in mind that, that adherence, you know, people who are sleepy are often more adherent to the CPAP. So that adherent group that's, that seems to be doing better, you know, whether it's because they're more sleepy, we don't know. But this is what happens if you, you know, with CPAP, it's not like a drug. It doesn't like, like wear off slowly. It's an all or nothing thing. So here's a subject, he was happily sleeping on CPAP and we turned his CPAP down. I turned it down like by about three centimeters of water and he got back into an apnea. And then here's his obstructive apnea with very high sympathetic drive and here's his blood pressure going up to you know, 200 over 120 or something. So, so if you think about a fib or you think about acute cardiac arrhythmia, you think about rupture of a, of a coronary artery causing a myocardial infarction, these are the things that do it, these acute events, these, these sudden, like, you happily chugging along, not okay in the world, breathing okay, your brain's happy, and then suddenly somebody turns down your CPAP, and then you get apneic, and you get this high level of catecholamines, high blood pressure, hypoxemia, hypercapnia, which you have not been able to be acclimated to, because you see this apnea has been treated for part of the night. You didn't have that normal, okay, I'm gonna get into this gently and get apneic and get some preconditioning and, and know what it's about. This is like, you know, I don't wanna talk about the frog in the hot water, but there's no really, you know, this is, this is that kind of thing. You know, suddenly, bam, you, you hit with an apnea. And so this would trigger AFib. So it may be that even if you're using CPAP, you just, you just go off the rails just briefly once and you're back in, in AFib. So what about ventricular arrhythmias, myocardial infarction, and sudden death? Let's first look at timing. And this, this is the data from Apur Gami when he was uh, in our lab. And what Apur did was he looked at, the, um, at people in the general Olmsted County area who had sudden death. And the sudden death was either witnessed or they knew with, with very good specificity what time people died. And we also knew that because all of them had had sleep studies, whether or not they had sleep apnea. So Apu asked the question, if you have apnea, when do you die versus if you don't have apnea? Is, that, is there any difference? And this is what he found. So these are people who didn't have sleep apnea in the blue. And people who didn't have sleep apnea, not many died between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. 24% died. Now remember, you're dividing this into three different time zones. So if there was, everything was a wash, you'd get one third of people dying here, one third dying here, and one third dying here. Well, it turned out that during the night, and that's not unreasonable, if you didn't have apnea, you know, only a quarter of people died. More of them died in that after waking from sleep, after 6 a.m. And then a third, a very nice responsive, appropriate third died between 2 p.m. and 10 p.m. But if you look at the apnics, more than half died during the nighttime, between 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And then less died in this normal vulnerable time, and then less so even, even down the road. So there's something about apnea that if you have sudden death, it's more likely to happen during the nighttime. And how would you die? Well, it seems like it possibly could be that you're having ventricular arrhythmias because what Zayden Shwiri did was he took people with ICDs and he said, okay, I've got all these people with ICDs about 
71 or so. And I know who has apnea and who doesn't have apnea. And I know that the devices are firing appropriately. So let me see if apnea makes a difference to what time the device fires. Well, if you take people who don't have apnea, HI less than 10, um, you end up with, with no real difference in the timing of the, of the shocks or the preponderance of shocks. But those with apnea, more than 10, more of them had shocks occurring between midnight and 6 a.m. So if you have a patient who is icily fires while he's asleep, check for sleep apnea, because that may be the trigger for the arrhythmia. We don't know if treating the apnea is going to prevent the arrhythmia. That, that's important. It could also be a myocardial infarction. This is based on data from Farima Sert when she was with us. And what Farima did was take everybody who came to, to this prospective study, everybody who came to, um, to um, uh, St. Mary's Hospital with a myocardial infarction. This study was done together with Apur Gami and Arturo Garcia Tushad. And she said, okay, I know that all of you, none of you had had a sleep study before. And I know that I know exactly what time your heart attack started because I'm only taking people who had chest pain announcing their MI. So she could tell with precision when the MI started because she used chest pain as the, as the index event, index symptom. And so what she found was pretty much similar to what we found with the sudden death study. That when she looked at people who came in with an MI and we did a sleep study on them and they didn't have apnea, very few had that MI coming on between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. More of them had it between six and two, and, and then you had these, this group here. But then if you took people with, with obstructive apnea, which she found after they came in, she found that if you had obstructive apnea, you are much more likely to have your heart attack occur between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., less likely during the rest of the day. So if you know sleep apnics tend to have a greater likelihood of dying during the night, it could be because they have arrhythmias during the night, or they have myocardial infarction during the night. So that, that, those are two things to consider. Now, what happens when we treat people with sleep apnea with the aim of preventing a cardiovascular event? Well, we have not yet been able to show benefit. Okay, this is a SAVE study, a very large study, just came out a couple of years ago, Rikatsa, uh, Circas, uh, looking at CPAP on the incidence of hypertension in non-sleepy patients with sleep apnea. There was a signal there that CPAP may be preventing hypertension, but it didn't reach significance probably because it's underpowered. Neither of these two studies showed a benefit, but the SAFE, for example, said, well, if you use CPAP for more than six, four hours a night, you could potentially prevent strokes. And that signal was there, but that was a post hoc analysis of and more like an adherence study rather than a true intention to treat study. Here, so, and I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. And it more comes along of these changes. It all seems like we're fighting a balance between surges, if I if I understand you correctly. It's the surge Correct. in our sympathetic parasympathetics. So does the surge, and again, this this a lot of this is us just making conjecture, but does that surge make you more vulnerable to potential plaque rupture? Does that surge make you, especially at nighttime with the arrhythmias, what bothers me is you know, we tend to be more bradycardic. Yes. And if we're more bradycardic, the QT prolongs. Mm -hmm. And if we're more bradycardic and the QT prolongs, then we get a sympathetic surge and we have PVCs that come at the wrong time. Maybe these patients have VF. Yes, absolutely right. Absolutely. And then the other thing about the bradycardia, as you know, mm -hmm. sleep apnea itself causes you to get bradycardia because the diving reflex. So there you go. You got this, you know, you get people with 10 seconds of a systole. And that heart has got nothing to do and really is easily getting up to, to, to bad arrhythmias in that interim when it's not beating the way it should. So that, that adds another dimension because the, 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 the surges occur in response to apnea as do the bradyarrhythmias. Again, getting back to the fact that, that this is an, seems to be an acute phenomenon. But anyway, all of these studies, again, they looked at non-sleepy people. And, and I'm gonna get to your point about sleepiness. These are data from about 104 people that, that had been studied who'd had MIs. And then we looked at whether they had sleep apnea. We also looked at whether they had sleepiness. And so Frank Shea, who was a fellow with us from China, looked at the data together with Naima Kovacin and, 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 and some of our other colleagues. 
and said, okay, we think sleepiness is a big issue. What happens to these patients who had sleep apnea and an MI? And it turned out also, for the first thing I have to tell you, for some reason that I have yet to understand, people who have heart attacks who also have apnea don't go to the sleep lab to get treated. And, and I don't know, we send them letters, we say, look, this is awful, you need to get your bad apnea, you need to be treated, seen, they just blow it off. And I, I, it may be because it's not in the guidelines and that, that's quite a reasonable approach. And they may be right, I don't know. But if you look at all of these people, we've, none of them went and got treatment. We followed them up for four years. And this is what happened. These are people in the orange with an AHI of more than 15 who are sleepy. They have EDS, daytime sleepiness. The blues are people who have an AHI more than 15 but are not sleepy. And the greens are people with an AHI less than five. They don't have apnea. They had a heart attack. They don't have apnea. So I want you to look at the difference. The real trouble, 50% plus in MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events, were in the apnics who are sleepy. You take the apnics, AHI more than 15, so it's reasonably bad apnea, but they're not sleepy. They actually, for three years after their heart attacks, 36 months right there, there's really no difference on no treatment between them and someone who doesn't have apnea. So you could treat this group with CPAP till the cows come home, and they are not gonna be any different from, from this group because they didn't have a problem to start off with. And so this is the thing about, about you know, exactly what, what you said and, and what we've been thinking about the randomized controlled trials is if you leave out the high-risk group, well, you're taking these guys and you know, already there's not much difference between the two and how you're gonna find a benefit. So it's important to keep that in mind. Excellent. Excellent. So let's summarize the, the, the concept of CPAP and cardiovascular risk reduction. CPAP is modestly effective in lowering blood pressure, especially in patients with resistant hypertension. In non-sleepy patients with sleep apnea, CPAP didn't really lower the risk of cardiovascular events. And some risk reduction, even in these non-sleepy people, was seen in those who were CPAP adherent. So there's something. And then despite consistent data and observational studies, the randomized uh, controlled trials of CPAP, and there's only two, there's our little one, and there's the other big one, biggish, medium, okay, medium-sized one. And uh, both of them were non-sleepy people and neither of them showed benefit. Um, and so, so, uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Why is CPAP not more effective? Well, we've got to think about secondary versus primary prevention. There are two different things. Secondary prevention is a little bit easier because you've got a really tough substrate, but then little bits of, of mistreatments when you have a surge of bradycardia and secondary, you've got more substrate that's just easily you know, affected by the things. So it's hard to say. It's like aspirin. You know, aspirin's good for secondary prevention, less great for primary prevention. You know, how CPAP fits in there, we don't know. Suboptimal CPAP adherence is part of it. Non-sleepy phenotype is, has been studied, not so much the sleepy people. We need to think about alternative measures of categorizing these people, maybe using the hypoxemic burden, the sleep quality, the autonomic responses to arousals. We may need to think about putting these patients into clusters, you know, find that cluster, that cluster of phenotype and genotype and micro RNA type that, that, that just says these are high-risk people, and then you treat those and, and maybe get a response. And then we need alternative treatments that are more effective and sustained through the night. And that, that, you know, we, if, if we found a drug that prevented apnea, that would be really nice. Um, and we need to consider the possibility yet again that treating sleep apnea doesn't reduce C CV events with CPAP or maybe with anything else, perhaps because the pathophysiologic process once activated is not easily fixed, it's not easily reversible. Um, and so I'm gonna now just touch back on our scientific statement. When do you do screening for sleep apnea? Do it in resistant, poorly controlled hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, recurrent AFib. Consider a sleep study. If there's signs of symptoms of sleep apnea in the setting of NYHA class two to four, tachybrady syndrome, sick sinus syndrome, patient with VT, survivors of sudden death, stroke, 
And I would also say if someone has chest pain, waking them from sleep, if someone has um, uh, appropriate shocks in the ICD, waking them from sleep, someone had an MI occurring during sleep, definitely just look for sleep apnea. And would you also add, I know it's not in the guidelines, but especially if they're really sleepy after they've had an MI. True. Should we true. be doing more of that? I, I think I think you really should. I, I really I've never thought that through properly, but you know that that actually is a very important thing. It's kind uh, of like we send the patient yeah. for cardiac rehab and we put yeah. them on statins and all these other drugs, but uh, maybe we give them before they leave the hospital, you know, the Epley sleep score. Yeah. Or something. And then yeah. if there's an issue that that they have a huge treatment effect. Yes. In fact, what you're talking about, as I'm thinking it through, is this group over here. This group here. Yeah, exactly. These guys exactly. have an MI. They yeah. sleep. You're deep. not going to change the, the, the green and the blue, but you have yeah. a huge benefit from the, yeah. the yellow orange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's actually a really good good point. I'm going to touch quickly on uh, options for treating sleep apnea, just for complete mistake. And you know, you've got different positive airway pressure modalities, uh, CPAP, APAP, and ASV is something I want, I want to talk very quickly about. ASV, if your patient finds positive airway pressure hard to deal with, think about ASV. It's kind of like a breathing pacemaker. It kind of learns how you breathe. And then when you're at night, when you stop breathing, then it'll kick in and start working. It's like automatic positive, automated positive airway pressure. And um, also think about lifestyle interventions and weight loss. Positional therapy, very important. If you're lying on your back and you lose muscle tone, your jaw falls backwards. You know, if you sleep on your side, you're much, more, you're much less likely to become apneic. And so having a, having a little T-shirt with a, with a tennis ball sewed in the back is, is going to be helpful to stop you sleeping on your back. Oral appliances, I like these a lot because they're easily transportable. They work well in people with mild CPAP. Then you've got upper airway surgery. Eh, you know, I try the others first, but certainly worth considering. Neurostimulation is a new thing. You put in a, a, a pacemaker and then that uh, stimulator and that, that stimulates the, the hypoglossal nerve and, and helps pull the tongue out of the airway. Uh, bariatric surgery. No, you know, never been tried in apnea per se, but when you treat obese people with apnea, with bariatric surgery, when they lose weight, the apnea gets better, which stands to reason, but it suggests that that's an option. Now, last directions for future research. We need more. Go ahead. Did you have a question? No, oh, I think it's fantastic. So this is really almost the last slide. It's that we need more comprehensive use of wearable devices and remote monitoring technologies to give us more robust validation studies and screening and treating uh, apneic people. And that'll also help us better identify high-risk clusters using AI, again, to identify people with sleep apnea, who has actionable data, and, and personalized therapies for them, uh, improving our home diagnostic tools. Right now, we can do everything, but we don't really do the brain waves well. We don't really do the, the muscle tone well. If we can throw all that into one little, very easily, uh, a minimally intrusive pot that people can take home and wear, that'd be great. Uh, we need better cardiovascular risk stratification and better ways of identifying which patients with OSA should be treated with the goal of preventing or mitigating cardiovascular disease. That's important because they should be treated anyway for their apnea and their daytime fatigue and their sleepiness and cognitive dysfunction, depression, maybe erectile dysfunction. I am only talking about cardiovascular disease, okay? There's a, there's a host of other reasons why apneic patients should be treated. There's the issue of addressing structural racism and, and disparities and equities that, um, that uh, affect the higher prevalence and the increased risk of, of, of bad outcomes in people with sleep apnea and cardiovascular disease. And we need innovative and effective, effective, effective options for therapy that are better tolerated and cost-effective. And so I'll, I'll leave it there and, and take any more questions that come up. Amazing. Thank you so much. I mean, Thanks, Chris. what a masterful job. Just such an overview and everything that's critical. And then it was just very enjoyable. Do you think we have a couple time, time for a couple questions from the audience? 
Okay. So one person, it's kind of, I know you're, you're interested in this. It's kind of getting along the lines of the sleep quality in the brain waves. So one of our listeners asked, you recommend a home sleep EEG headband. And their question is kind of, are we just going to go with the CPAP or should we also look along home overnight oximetry along with home EEG monitoring? Great question. Um, you know, a lot of these home devices that, that, that promise to measure sleep, they tell you measuring REM sleep, I'm telling you about your deep sleep. I don't know how, how really truly they do what they say they can do. Because many of them are available over the counter. They've never been, I don't know, maybe they have, but none of the ones I've seen have been thoroughly validated in, in, in really you know, good studies against the gold standards. So, you know, I, it's hard to answer that question without knowing whether the device has been proven to truly look at your EEG or is it measuring something else? So it's just making, you know, educated guesses. So I don't know. But if we do get to the point where we can have a headband EEG with an oximetry and uh, breathing movements and things like that all together in one easy, cheap, portable fashion, that would be great. Fantastic. And then another question, and this is more, I think, for clarity, the MI incidence in non-sleep apnea is down between 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., but they had thought it was increased at that time. And I believe you, you had mentioned it's increased during the sleep periods. The not people decreased. without apnea, people without apnea have, yep. have less. So the people, if you have apnea, you're much more likely to die during the nighttime, between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. If you don't have apnea, you tend to die after 6 a.m. Between 6 and 11 is your vulnerable time period. And that's been consistent in the literature. There's something about that 6 to 11 time period that, that you know, whether it's clotting, whether it's a surges in, in, in blood pressure when you wake up, whether it's a sympathetic activation, whether it's a change in posture, whether it's running in the, to, to catch the bus or being late for work, all those things come together to make if you don't have apnea, 6 to 11 is a vulnerable time. If you have apnea, midnight to 6 a.m. is a tough time. Very nice. And then last question. Uh, someone asks, how do we explain it takes three years before we start to see events in the OSA folks without sleepiness? This might get to the part that, like you were saying, it might be dose dependency. Does, does OSA ever progress so yeah, so, so that, that is actually a really good question. And, and I never really thought about it from that perspective. So thank you, whoever asked that question. Um, I, you know, I, even, even at after three, even after three. Um, now, I guess it could just so, be that feedback circuit, right? You get sleepy, you're less likely to exercise, you gain more weight, you might have worsening sleep apnea, and then you're in absolutely. that vicious cycle. Absolutely. You know, we don't know what happened here. We don't know. They, did they, did they, you know, did they get more apnea? Did they start becoming sleepy? Did, uh, you know, did other things happen? Did they not take their Lipitor and then they got more plaques and, you know, they, did they then, you know, were they just more vulnerable? I don't know. I don't know the answer. Um, but it is interesting that, that it starts to diverge after three years. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought about it from that point of view before. Why? I just said, well, that's interesting. They diverge only at three years. Never ask myself, why the heck do they diverge at three years? What happened? Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. Well, Varen, thank you so much. We've all learned a lot. I've learned a lot. And I always enjoy watching you present because I always pick up more new things, no matter how many times I see you give presentations. It's always just fun because it always stays very interactive for us. And I learned something new. And thank you so much. Our listeners are going to greatly enjoy this, I'm certain. And they're also going to be able to go to our CV education site at cveducation.mayo.edu and watch this five, six, seven times, you know, in order to help them maybe fall asleep. No, yeah, just kidding. I think once it's to keep them for, awake. For the Sutherland's effect, I've heard that once is enough. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's yeah. been it's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. You're very kind. I appreciate the chance to do this.